today. He is due to come home tomorrow. So please, let's remember all those folks in our prayers. And I believe that's all I have other than to remind you about our bulletin that has lots of information in there and uh, did not repeat all that's in that. So please keep all those folks in your prayer. And again, thank you for being out tonight. And let's start with the song. is whiter than snow. Faithful love calms each fear, reaches down, cries each fear, holds my hand when I can stand on my own. Faithful Please open your Bibles to Psalms chapter 100. Psalms chapter 100. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's have prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for that faithfulness that we just read about, the goodness that we read about, the creation. We thank you so much for just allowing us to enjoy uh, the small portion of what you have given to us and um, help us to always be thankful for, for what we have. God, it's good for us to be here. It's good for good for us to be with your family and and um, be able to study more about you and learn more about you and and lift your name on high. 
We thank you so much for this family that meets here and all the activities that we have. We just ask that you you bless the discussions, the, the Bible classes that we have tonight, the teachers, you be with them, help guide them in their words, uh, be with the discussion tomorrow night and um, and Saturday, the, the Golden Age lunch. Father, we thank you so much for all that everyone does for reaching out and, and being a, a friend, a family here in Rogersville. We thank you so much for Jesus, and it's through his name that we pray. Amen. The Old Rugged Cross On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame And I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners was slain So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown You may be dismissed for class. Good evening again. Glad that you are here. I know uh, I did not, I have not heard yet if we are online. I know we got some folks that were <clears throat> asking about that. So our guys that are up there in the booth, if y'all could check on that for me, so my phone will stop blowing up. People stop asking me. Uh, I would appreciate that. That would be a great help to me. Uh, so if y'all can check on that for me, I would appreciate it. Thrilled that we have the opportunity to study together tonight. We are in, believe it or not, we are in week nine of this study. It seems like it hadn't been that long, but it has. It's been nine solid weeks we've been 
pursuing what we've called the, the greatest story ever told, and we mean that not in tongue-in-cheek, we mean that in actuality, in reality, uh, that that sort of moniker is thrown around on television and in movies. Um, I saw uh, an ad not too long ago for a movie that was coming out, I think it's next year, and their tagline was, uh, join us as we tell the greatest story ever told, and it was not about Jesus, I can promise you that. Uh, and I was thinking, well, y'all missed out then, because that's not it. Um, and that's kind of been our, our premise, that's sort of been our aim. And I hope that it's been beneficial to you to take a, a maybe, like I said, at the very outset of this class, uh, a different look, a new look, um, a fresh set of eyes, whatever terminology you want to use, but just sort of look at these stories again, maybe a little more in depth. Uh, things that you've heard and you've read for yourself probably countless times. Uh, it's amazing what can happen when you go and you read it again, just one more time. Uh, you'll notice something that you didn't notice the last 53 times you read it. Uh, and that's been the way it's been for me personally, and I hope it's been that way for you. Tonight, we're going to go three different places, but you can go to Luke 5, and you can kind of settle in at Luke 5. We're going to ultimately kind of keep coming back to Luke 5, uh, mainly because uh, Matthew and Mark sort of split these two stories up that we're going to cover tonight, whereas Luke kind of includes them sort of back to back. Um, and in other places, like Mark, you're going to find them kind of back to back. And Matthew, they're separated by another event or so. And so Luke 5, you can kind of put your, your anchor down there, and that's kind of where we'll settle. Beginning in verse 12 is where we'll start in just a minute. I love moments where we get to see Jesus interact with individuals. You don't see that all too often throughout Scripture. A lot of times you're, you're finding Jesus teaching to large crowds. A lot of times you find Jesus in situations where uh, as the crowd came to Him, or you see just these moments where Jesus is up in front of maybe dozens of people, hundreds of people. But then there's those little bitty snapshots, and I don't know if you picked up on this, but we've kind of focused on those snapshots several different times here in the last nine weeks. Uh, for instance, would be in John chapter 3, when Jesus and Nicodemus have a moment together. On a particular Sunday morning a couple of weeks ago, we looked at John chapter 4, where Jesus sat next to a woman at a well, and he had an incredible encounter with this woman that led her to change her entire existence in this particular study, you're going to see one individual conversation. And then you're going to see what I think is one of the rarest things you'll see in, in the ministry of Jesus. And that is an individual conversation amidst a massive group of people. And it's just one of the coolest things to witness. So I hope that's what you'll, you'll pick up on as we go. So Luke chapter 5, let's start in verse 12. And let's get into our study. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one. But go and show yourself to the priest. and Make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for a proof to them. But now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in, because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them. Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. 
Two stories, two examples. In story number one, you see Jesus as the master of exterior physical issues. Now, here's something that you need to know, and it's probably a footnote in your Bible. It's, it's in every, almost in every situation where leprosy is mentioned, my Bible has a footnote. And if you go and you look at that footnote in your Bible, it's going to tell you that leprosy did not mean leprosy the way that we sort of uh, term it. When we hear leprosy, we specifically think of a flesh-eating disease that if left unchecked, and ultimately there was no cure for it, if left unchecked, it would lead to your death. It would eat away at the skin, it would rot away the bones, and ultimately you would die of leprosy. However, I want you to put your ribbon in your Bible right there at at Luke chapter 5, and I want you to go to Leviticus 13 just for a moment. Now, Alex and I were talking about this earlier today, and you can really, uh, I hope you, uh, if you've eaten supper, then, then maybe don't read all of Leviticus 13. If you haven't eaten yet, maybe you can go ahead and read it, but if you have, I would caution you. This would be one of those kind of advisory chapters. Leviticus 13 is a really graphic chapter. And to to put it in terms that I think all of us will understand, it's just gross. There's just some gross things discussed in Leviticus chapter 13. Some uncomfortable, non-medical terms are used. I'll give you an example. If you look at verse 2 of Leviticus chapter 13, When a person has on the skin of his body a swelling or an eruption or a spot. Okay. Kind of wrap your brain around that. That that is unsavory to say the least. When someone has something on their skin and you term it an eruption. Yikes. That makes my stomach hurt. So here's what you need to know. If you read Leviticus 13, and like I said, I caution you if you had a meal recently, you're going to pick up on some things there that they termed leprous disease. Which the intention was leprous or leprosy in the case of what you find in Luke chapter 5. And you can go back there now if you want to go back to Luke 5. Didn't always mean leprosy like what you and I maybe think, the flesh-eating disease, the, the, the thing that we kind of remember, the lepers and those kinds of things. Leprosy literally meant any type of skin abnormality. So boils would have been considered leprosy. Skin infections would have been considered leprosy. They would have have just termed it this big umbrella term, leprous disease. And the reason why that's important, okay, is because if you notice in Luke chapter 5, Luke is very clear in verse 12 to say that this man doesn't have leprosy in the sense of what we term it. Luke says this man is full of leprosy. When I read that, it brought a new light to this whole occasion, this whole story. Because when you look at this from the eyes of those in the town, look at what Luke says about Jesus. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. There's not anybody else in that town that would have done that. There's not another person in his vicinity that would have done that. Nobody is going to touch him. As a matter of fact, this is the kind of guy that walks down the street and people cross the street so they don't even have to get near him. Because for one to be considered full of leprosy, that is to say that basically from head to toe, his skin was in such a disgusting way that basically that's what you saw and that's what you noticed about this man. So don't look past what Luke says about him. Luke says he's full of leprosy. And the visual that you and I need to wrap our head around is this is a man that when you saw him coming, you, your stomach was turned by his very presence. Nobody else in his town is hollering out his name and asking him to come to lunch. Nobody in his town is saying, hey man, is everything okay? Is there something I can do for you? No, everybody in his town says, there's that guy. Let me see how far away I can get from him. If you look specifically... 
Uh, I believe it's in the Mark, in Mark chapter 1. If you go to Mark chapter 1, yes, Mark chapter 1, Mark's account of this adds one little layer in verse 41 of Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1 verse 41, or Mark writes that Jesus was moved with pity. So when you add that to the picture, you have a man who nobody wants to be around. You have a man who nobody wants to touch, certainly. And when Jesus sees him, this man falls at his feet and says, If you will, you can cleanse me. And there's no hesitation from Jesus at all. Because Jesus sees him for what he is. Jesus doesn't see him the way that humans see him. Jesus sees him as a soul, as one who is, who is hurting. And Jesus reaches out and he puts his hand on him. Now, application. We try to make an application in these accounts. This one's pretty simple. There have been times in my life, I guarantee you, I was untouchable. Things that I'd done, things that I'd said, the life I was living, I'm sure there were moments in my life where I would have been deemed untouchable. Do you remember we sang a song this past Sunday? The title of the song is, He Touched Me. And the very first line of the song is, Shackled by a heavy burden. Have you ever felt that way? You ever felt that way? You ever felt like you were chained to something that you just couldn't turn loose of? Maybe it's guilt. Maybe it's shame. Whatever it is, you ever felt that way? Sure you have. I have too. And the song goes on to say that He reached out and He touched me. And now I am no longer the same. When you think about that, you play that out in this man's life. This man came to Jesus covered in who knows what. But certainly in a physical sense, in an exterior sense, he is untouchable. And the only thing he knows to do is to go to Jesus. In Luke's account, you see what he says to Jesus. And it's important that we cover this. It's important that you understand the faith of this man coupled with the grace of Jesus. Listen again to what the man says to Jesus. This is in verse 12 of Luke chapter 5. Lord, first of all, he calls him what he is. Lord, if you will. Now you need to understand what that means. That's not a polite way of saying if you want to. That's a sacred way of saying if it be your will. Oftentimes we pray things and we pray about someone who's sick or we pray about someone who is hurting and we say, Lord, if it be your will, restore that one. And we, we have catchphrase or pet phrases that we use, right? What do we say? Restore them back to their most wanted health, right? That's what we always say. It's like God, garden, direct, right? I was like 20 something years old when I realized you didn't have to start every prayer with dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and, every, and all the many blessings of it. I thought that was just how every prayer started because that was how every boy at Mars Hill Bible School led prayer. We have pet phrases, but we pray that, don't we? I've prayed that myself. Now, here's the question is, do, do you really mean it? Do I really mean it when we pray it? Because it's very important that you understand what you say when you say, if it be your will, because truthfully, you need to be okay with the outcome, not because of your own personal investment, you need to be okay with the outcome because God is God and you're not. That is, the, that is the testimony, if you will, of this man as he stands before Jesus. Lord, if, you, if it's your will, if it's not, then it is what it is. But if you will, and then look at the second part of his statement, you can make me clean. How about that for faith? Lord, I know. I know everything is your will, not mine. I get that. If you will, then I know you have the ability to make me clean. It's a twofold statement that's, that's incredible. It is an acknowledgement of your will. And beyond that, it's an acknowledgement of his faith in Jesus to do what he says he can do. 
Lord, I know, I know you can do this. And if it's your will, then, then do it. Now, would Jesus still have been the Messiah? Would Jesus still have been God if he would have turned and walked from this man and not healed him? Yes, absolutely, 100%. Because we know that there were probably people who were ill, who were sick, who had diseases, who had some type of, of malady that Jesus did not heal. That, that There's no doubt that that happened. So would Jesus still have been God? Would Jesus still have been the Messiah? Would Jesus still have been the Savior of the world had he walked away from this man on that particular day? Yes, absolutely. But it is that Mark 1.41 that you need to kind of keep in the back of your mind in this particular account. It is moved with pity. Jesus sees through the abnormalities and he sees the heart of a broken heart. He sees the broken heart of a soul who desperately wants to be whole. you ever been so desperate that you'd do almost anything? Sadly, some of us have done that for all the wrong reasons. Some, sadly, some of us have been desperate for all the wrong reasons. This is not a man who's desperate for wrong reasons. He's desperate for the right reasons. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Lord, I just, I, I don't know what else to do. So I'm on my knees in front of you. I will tell you in moments of desperation there have been a lot of people that have come to know Christ in the midst of their deepest and darkest moments because they finally realize there's no man, there's no woman, there's no program, there's no building that can save you. The only salvation you're going to find comes through Jesus and Him alone. And when this man falls before Jesus, that's the point he's at. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. I, I'm just, I'm here in front of you. I, I don't have anywhere else to go. I don't have anything else to do. I'm here. Jesus moved with pity. Mark 1.41 says, stretched out his hand, verse 13 of Luke 5. And he touched it. You and I don't understand it. We don't, because we've never been in that situation. The closest thing that you might could kind of jokingly refer to is this pandemic. When it became sort of the norm to not give people handshakes or hugs. That might be the closest thing, and even that, you're not even touching. You're not even close. This man has lived who knows how many years with people avoiding his very appearance. When I was uh, eight years old, I, I was a catcher. My dad was my baseball coach growing up from the time I was six to the time I was about 11. And because he, he just knew he could tell me to do it and I would do it, I was a catcher. Now, there's a reason why they call the catcher's gear the tools of ignorance. Because anybody that puts them on and catches, you just know you're going to end up wearing one every practice, every game, and probably more than one. Well, it just so happened I'm out there. We're taking infield before the game. And I remember dad hit one to the center fielder. He comes up, throws it to second. The shortstop turns, throws it to home. And I, for whatever reason, lost it as he threw it. And that thing hit me right in the eyebrow. I mean, hard too. I mean, it was that sickening thud. And I remember, if you've ever been hit by a baseball, you know, especially on any, like, on a bone. If you've been hit by a baseball or softball on a bone, that little pop knock that comes up, I had one, and it looked like I had a horn growing out the side of my eyebrow. Now, of course, my father, being the compassionate, loving, tender man that he is, said, rub some dirt on it, you've got to catch six innings. And I remember crying, you know, I couldn't see out of my right eye, and he's like, well, push the knot up, son, I don't know what to tell you. Can you see through your mask? No. Well, figure it out. Catch one eye. Thanks, Dad. Appreciate it. But I remember going to bed that night with this unicorn thing growing off the side of my head. And I remember thinking, waking up the next morning thinking, I hope it's gone because if i got to go to school, everybody's going to see this monstrosity on the side of my head and think that I'm turning into some kind of an alien. 
And I remember I woke up the next morning, and it was still there. It wasn't quite as bad, but it was still there. And I remember being nervous, like anxious about going to school because I thought, when I walk in the door, everybody's going to be like, what is wrong with your head? I saw stars for probably a month. No, I, I think it was, I mean, it was bad. Like I remember, you know, probably nowadays they wouldn't let you play for like six years. You'd go into concussion protocol and that'd be it. But I remember, you know, I remember being physically almost sick, thinking that everybody was going to look at me with this thing on the side of my head. You know how long that lasted? About two hours. I got to school. Of course, I walked in the door. One of my buddies was like, dude, what happened to your face? That's a real friend. I think I had a couple people jokingly ask me if they could hang their coats on it. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. You look like a cubby. Oh, awesome. You know, like one of the little hooks that you hang your cubby on. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate that, guys. After about an hour or two, that was that was it. It was over. Next day, it had pretty much gone back to normal. It was a nice bruise on the side. That was it. That's one day. Guys, I, I don't know how long this guy's been dealing with this. It's you, you, We don't understand it. All he's ever wanted is for somebody to talk to him. Beyond that, all he's ever wanted is for somebody just to reach out and touch him. Pat him on the shoulder, hug him, shake his hand, tell him it's going to be all right. Even though he knows it's not. That's all he wants. And there ain't nobody going to do that. Until Jesus. See, the part that I want you to pay attention to, in Mark 1.41, it says he had pity on him. Luke 5 and verse 13, he reached out and touched him. That is a man full of grace. Sees him for what he is. A soul reaches out to a soul that's broken hearted, a soul that's hurting. And he doesn't tell him, well, it's going to be all right. Don't worry about it. Rub some dirt on it. You'll be all right. And he reaches out and he gives him the thing that he knows he wants the most. He puts his hand on it. The cleansing... The cleansing comes after that. You notice? Jesus meets his physical need first. His emotional need first. This is a man broken hearted, a man broken down, and Jesus reaches out and puts his hand on it. Then Jesus says, I will be clean. The Bible tells you in verse 13, Luke chapter 5, immediately the skin disease left him. Secondary example that you find here is in the warning of Jesus. Verse 14 says, He charged him to tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest, make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded for a proof to them. The reason why he does this is really simple, but it's really profound. If you go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, you're going to see Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount about the law. Because many people believe Jesus to be some sort of uh, liberal, heretic, lunatic that was out to destroy the law. But if you read Matthew 5, verse 17 to verse 20, you're going to find Jesus saying, I didn't come to destroy the law, I actually came to fulfill it. For all those that would have called him a liberal, for all those that would have called him some sort of heretic, the truth of the matter is, Jesus is far more conservative than even the Pharisees are. For instance, look at the Sermon on the Mount. Consider all the times that Jesus said, you have heard it said this, but I tell you that. If you go and you look and you examine those closely, you're going to find that Jesus says, you've heard it said this, and he gave them what the law said. And what he said, what I tell you, is far more conservative than what the law said. How about this one? You've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say that if you look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Now, how about that? That's far more, if you want to call it conservative, I hate those terms, you know that I do, I say that all the time, I hate conservative and I hate liberal, I hate it. I hate those terms. I think that's caused part of the divide, but that's my soapbox for a whole other problem, a whole other time. That's far more restrictive, how about that term? You've heard it said, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder, but I say love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. Well, now, wait a minute, Jesus. Now, you're stepping way too far here. But see, they would have called him a liberal. They would have called him out to saying he was destroying the law. And yet here he is saying, no, I didn't come to destroy the law. 
came to fulfill it. And if you'll notice the phrase, the phrase right at the end of his statement in verse 14, for a proof to them. Now you use them and they all the time, right? They said to do this. They said to do that. They said this. Well, according to them, and my question always to my kids in my class when I was teaching was, who's they? Who's them? Okay, so I'll ask you this question. Who's them? Who's he talking about? This seems sort of a, a random thing for Jesus to say as a proof to them. Who's them? I'll give you a hint. It starts with fair and ends with issy. Any guesses? Very good. You guys have your thinking caps on tonight. He's, he's basically saying those, those people that would accuse me of destroying the law, I'm going to prove to them that I'm not here to destroy the law. I'm here to fulfill it. So you go do exactly what the law says you are to do. Yes, I healed you miraculously. Absolutely, that is the case. I healed you miraculously. But you know what you're going to do? You're going to do exactly what the law says so that they will have no other recourse but to say, how did you get healed? And man, what a testimony this guy's got, right? You think Jesus was thinking, I hope they ask him how he got healed. Of course he is. Would you think that man was walking back to do what it, what it is the, the law said he had to do? Don't you think he was thinking, I can't wait. They're going to ask me how I got healed because you know this is a guy that is familiar to these people. And now he's healed. Now he can return back home. He can return back to his day, daily living that he enjoyed before this disease or abnormality struck. And he's got an incredible story to tell. The second story that you find there in Luke chapter 5 deals with Jesus being the master of interior physical issues. He's going to deal with a man's paralysis. But more importantly and most importantly of all, you're going to find in this particular story, Jesus is the master of spiritual issues. I love this story, so do you. A lot of people are familiar with this story. You know the story. A man is, is paralyzed. He's on a bed. And his friends load him up and they take him and they're going to take him to see Jesus. Just like the man in the previous story, they know of no other person that they can take this boy to but Jesus. When they get there, there's no way for them to get in. So many people have gathered in this place where Jesus is teaching that there's no room for anybody to get in. There's people all throughout that place where they are. There's people all around the outside of that place where they are. And these friends notice that the only way that they might could get to him is to go up. So they go up to the roof. They begin to remove those tiles and they find that there is this little bit of space that they could move their friend through and place him quite literally, in the, at the feet of Jesus. The presentation of this account by Matthew in Matthew chapter 9 gives us an image of the response of the Pharisees. And the presentation of, the account, of this account by Mark in Mark chapter 2 gives us an image of the true friendship and the faith of the men involved. So Luke takes those two accounts and for lack of a better term, combines them to fully explain what happened that day. You've got the Pharisees, you've got the teachers of the law sitting there. They're asking questions, they're demanding Jesus to answer them, and they're wanting to hear more about what Jesus has to say, maybe for good reasons, maybe for some not so good reasons. The crowd is bordering on out of control. There are people in every room, every space, including Jesus' personal space, even surrounding the house where they are. The creativity of these men is on full display. They maneuver to the roof to find a way to get to Jesus. So here's my question. Are we actively moving barriers out of the way to get to Jesus? Notice whose faith is rewarded on this day. It's not just the man on the bed. If you look there in Luke chapter 5, in verse 20, you're going to find these words. When he, speaking of Jesus, when he saw their faith. Well, who's there? That would be the friends that lowered, that lowered this man down in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith. It's the faith of the men who lowered the paralytic down that Jesus noticed. 
Much like the leper, their faith drew a response from the Master. Jesus is going to help his interior physical issue. We know that. But he deals with the true sickness first. The true sickness that he deals with is found in verse 20. When Jesus says, man, your sins are forgiven you. You see, here's the deal that perhaps maybe we're a little uncomfortable with. Because in our human minds, it feels like nothing would be worse than to be paralyzed. But can I tell you, there's something far worse than any physical abnormality or physical malady that you could come down with. And that is to be sin sick. Like I said, that's where we're uncomfortable because we truly don't want to acknowledge that because in our physical human brains, we believe that our physical body is of most importance. And sadly, it's become an idol for some. The truth is Jesus sees a physical body in front of him, but he sees right through the physical body and he sees to the soul and he realizes this man needs something far more than the ability to walk. This man needs the forgiveness of sins. Now you and I know that the Pharisees and the teachers of that day, they, they get up in arms. Who is this that forgives sins? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus looks into their hearts, looks into their thoughts and he says why do you question and then he says okay which is easier then to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk well what would they have said what was easier well it would have been much easier to say your sins are forgiven right and Jesus says okay if that's what's easy to you then let me do the hard thing and he turns to this man and here's that individual in the midst of a giant crowd, here is this individual moment. He's already had one moment with him where he told him his sins are forgiven. Now he turns back to him and says, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately it happens. At the end of both accounts, you see the response or responses that every person should have when interacting with Jesus. People were coming to him from every quarter. Luke says, great crowds gathered to hear him. And at the end of this section, in verse 26, you see these words. Amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe. Saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. If you can't read those accounts and if you can't put yourself in those moments and not be moved, then your heart is hardened. You're in danger. If you can't read these accounts and study your master and find these moments to be truly inspiring, then your heart is hardened and you're in danger. My question was, how many of us are removing barriers to get to Jesus? Well, that's your opportunity right now. You've heard the Word. You have to determine if you believe it, if you're willing to repent of the things, the sins, the things that are the barriers in your life. Are you willing to remove them? To confess that Jesus is exactly who He says He is. Exactly who the Word of God says He is. To then put Him on in baptism, washing away your sins rising to walk in newness of life. You have the opportunity to remove the barriers in your way tonight. My question is, will you do it? Will you have the courage? Will you have the strength to do it? You're encouraged by these people, I promise you. These people around you want you to be right with God tonight. If you're a Christian, but you find yourself maybe doubting a little bit, maybe struggling in your faith, and you want the prayers of the church, and that opportunity is yours. And certainly, if you have sin in your life that you need to confess this evening, that you need to repent of. You need to make right. There's absolutely no way that you need to leave this place without doing that. If there's something we can do for you, you know that we want to. Let us help you. Let us encourage you. As together we stand and sing this song.
Let's sing a common love. A common love for each other. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come here and worship you and sing sing your praises and study your word. Lord, help us to take what we have studied tonight and to apply it to our own lives and grow spiritually from it. Lord, we ask that you be with those of us that are struggling, both physically and spiritually. Give us the strength and comfort and the knowledge to know that you are there with us, uh, watching over us. Be with us tonight as we leave here. Help us to be the Christian examples that you want us to be, guide us, help us, help us to shine our, our Christian light. And Lord, we just thank you for all of your blessings and for the great sacrifice that was made on the cross to save us from our sins. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.